Get ready. As an instructor and clinical supervisor, I often see students completely thrown by the concept of masking. When I point out that masking is needed during testing, they freeze up and get discombobulated. I'm here to show you that masking is nothing to be afraid of once you break it down. The first thing we need to understand is why masking is so important. To demonstrate this, let's meet my nieces and nephews. Okay, so behind me are two rooms that represent your right and your left auditory pathway. The doorway represents your ear canal. And my teenage niece in here, well, she represents your right cochlea. And over in the next room is my teenage nephew representing the left cochlea. Like most teenagers, they do not want to be bothered by their siblings. And those little munchkins, they represent sound coming out of your earphones when testing, and they are about to unleash their fury on the right cochlea. Go get her, kids! doorway represents a seal from your headphones. So when using insert earphones during audiologic testing, make sure it is properly placed with minimal air leaks. Or if you are using headphones, make sure there are no leaks around the ear cushion. Okay, so let's get a good seal here on our door slash earphone here and go check on the left cochlea. So the sound that is intended only for the right cochlea is being propagated through the wall and is affecting the left cochlea. How much the wall blocks out sound represents the interaural attenuation of sound. And this wall represents, you get it, your head and skull. Poor kiddo, there's just no escaping them, is there? So why am I telling you this? Now that you know that sound propagates through the skull, it is very important that we audiologists test the ear that we want to test. For example, we can't have the left cochlea knowing that we're going to throw him a party tomorrow. What? You guys are throwing me a party? Oops. See what I mean? Excuse me a minute. We're not throwing you a party. We're writing with Sharpies. Duh. Okay, I'm just going to have you listen to this. There you go. Okay, so we can talk about him all we want, right? So why is that? It's because I'm masking the left cochlea over there, keeping him busy so I can discuss all the important party details with the right cochlea over here. Now, a long time ago, nifty people with a knack for acoustic calculated the attenuation of intensity by a noggin as sound travels from one ear over to the other. Now, there's something that you'll notice, that the attenuation of sound varies as a function of Dun, da, 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 the transducer! Now it appears that it takes less intensity to rattle the skull, so to speak, with the super oral headphones than it does with the insert headphones. Now why is that? Well that answer basically comes down to two words. Surface area. So let's say that this speaker here is the transducer we are using to test this giant ear. And this rice here represents bone. When you use super aura headphones, there is a greater surface area contact between the transducer and the ear slash bone. So when you play a tone, voila, the bone vibrates. However, when you use an insert earphone, the speaker is housed away from the ear. Because there is less contact between the speaker and the ear, you have to turn the intensity level up before you can rattle that rice. So now that we know why we mask, now the question is when do we mask? Now this is where we refer back to those very same people with the knack for acoustics. So we know the interaural attenuation value for each frequency and each headphone. Now don't sweat it. I'm not going to make you memorize all of these numbers. The only thing that you have to know with absolute certainty is the minimum attenuation value for each headphone. So for the headset, it's 40. The insert earphone, it's 55. And for bone, it's zero. These three numbers, you've got to memorize. Memorize this. Hi, my name's Rachel. I'm the audiology doctoral student. It's nice to meet you. Well, it's nice to meet you too, Rachel. So when I'm testing a patient, where do we start? Well, if you answer with a thorough case history, you are correct. 
Now, there are many questions that need to be asked during case history, but from a masking perspective, there are two very important questions. One is, which ear is better than the other? And two, is there a middle ear disorder that could possibly cause a conductive or mixed hearing loss? Knowing the answers to these two questions will help you decide whether you need to mask during testing. Now, I personally follow my case history interrogation with otoscopy and a mitten that includes tympanometry and acoustic reflexes before I put the patient into the booth for testing. You see, determination of masking is based on assumption. Because when you start the hearing test, you start with air conduction testing. And while you're testing by air conduction, you are thinking about the cochlea and making assumptions about the bone conduction thresholds the entire time. Starting with the mittens allows me to get as much information about the middle ear status before we even touch the audiometer. Now that flat right temp and absent acoustic reflexes mean you're gonna have your work cut out for you in there. Oh, chin up, let's do this thing. Okay, so we have him in the booth and we have chosen our transducer, the trusty super oral headphone. Now, what's the interoral attenuation of the super oral headphone? 40 dB. That's right, 40 dB. You can start your testing with either pure tone audiometry or the SRT, speech reception threshold testing. I personally like to start with the SRT because I could quickly confirm the better ear and also how much of a difference there is between the two ears. First, you get the SRT value of the reported better ear and then you switch over to the poorer ear. If the difference between the SRT values is greater than 40 dB, then you have to mask. Now before we go any further, I wanna make sure that you understand an assumption that we are making here. When we decide whether we need to or do not need to mask, we are comparing the air conduction threshold of the test ear to the bone conduction threshold of the non-test ear. Bone conduction. The bone conduction threshold that we haven't measured yet. See, now you understand why I like to do a mitten first. Because I measured normal middle ear function in the good ear, and because there was no report by the patient of pain, pressure, drainage from that good ear, I'm assuming that bone equals air conduction threshold in that ear. So the difference between this SRT value and the assumed bone conduction SRT value is less than 40 dB. Now let's look at another scenario. Let's say our patient here has a severe hearing loss in his right ear due to a childhood illness, but he comes to you because he has pain in his left ear accompanied by oral pressure and tinnitus. So you look in his ears and you see that it looks normal and healthy on the right side, but then when you look in his left ear, it looks like there's signs of a middle ear infection, which is confirmed by a flat temp. Since his left ear is still his reported better ear, we begin measuring the SRTs in that ear and get a value of 40 dB. Then we switch over to the right ear and measure the SRT in that ear, and we get a value of 7 dB. Now the difference between the air conduction values is 30 dB. But what can we assume about the bone conduction threshold of the left ear? Well, I would assume that it's either normal or possibly a slight loss based on his case history and tympanometric results. Remember, knowing when to mask is based on the difference between the air conduction value of the ear that you are testing and the bone conduction value of the opposite ear. So as you can see, the difference between these two values is greater than 40 dB. Now the masking rules and techniques for speech reception threshold testing are exactly the same as the masking rules and techniques for pure tone testing, which we're gonna get to in a second. Now back to reality. So my wonderful student here has moved on to pure tone audiometry and has just completed testing of the good left ear. And she's now ready to move on to that right ear. All right, we just finished with the left ear. Now we're gonna go to the right ear. You're gonna hear some static in that left ear, but just ignore that static and only press the button when you hear those beeps. Okay, she's starting with 1,000 hertz and she gets 45 dB as the threshold. The threshold in the left ear is 25 dB, so the difference is 20. I'm assuming that there's no conductive component in the left ear because of normal emittance, so she's gonna keep testing until she finds a difference of 40 dB or greater. Ahoy, now there's a big difference. 65 minus 10 equals 55 dB. So now the question is, does he hear it in his right ear, or is the sound being transferred to his left ear via bone conduction? There's only one way to find out masking. When masking, the first question is how much narrowband noise do we play to the good ear? Well, that's a very good question. 
There are many various rules for calculating the introductory masking level, and in the end, if the plateau method of masking is properly executed, we will all arrive at the same outcome. It's just like there are different driving directions to get to a destination. However, like directions, we want to pick the rule that gets to the proper outcome in the most efficient manner. So my rule of thumb for determining the appropriate minimum masking levels is this. When the threshold of the non-test year is normal or less than 15 decibels, just present the masking noise at 30. When it is between 15 and 60, just add 15 dB to the threshold value. When it is greater than 60 dB, add 10 dB to account for possible recruitment. So the threshold in the good ear is 10 decibels, so that means the masking level would be... 30. What do you think? Is that correct? You guessed it, 30 dB. Start your level. In order to demonstrate the plateau method of masking, we're gonna have the Battle of the Ears, where you get to see the actual cochlear responses. So Rachel here is gonna present narrow band masking noise to the left ear at 30 decibels. Then present the tone to the right ear at 65. No response. So she's gonna increase the level to the right ear to 70 and present the tone. We have a response. So which ear is it? Raise the level of the masking noise to 35 and present 70 again. No response. So this means that the good left ear was responding to that tone all along. So now raise the level of the tone to 75. And we have a response. Raise your noise to 40 now. And we still have a response. 45. And we have a response. This is the right ear. The right ear max threshold is 75 decibels. That's three responses in a row, so it must be the right ear responding, because we have achieved a plateau of three straight responses when the noise has increased 15 decibels. Now let's do another one, this time keeping you in the dark as to the cochlear responses. Cochleas, you can leave now. Okay, so the unmasked response is coming in at 50 decibels at 500 hertz, and the left ear is at 10 decibels. So 50 minus 10 is 40, so we have to mask. Hmm, so where would I start my masking levels? 30 dB. Very good. Who taught you to be so wise? Okay, let's see if I can do this. Masking noise on in the left ear at 30 dB. Present the tone to the right ear at 50 dB. No response. Okay, I'm gonna turn my tone up to 55 dB. Present again. I got a response, okay. Turn the noise up in the left ear to 35 dB. Present the tone again at 55 dB to the right ear. Another response! Mm -hmm. So I turn up the noise to 40 dB and present the tone again at 55. I got another response! I turn the noise up to 45 dB and present again at 55. I got the plateau! I have never been more proud. The next thing we're going to do is word recognition testing. Because word recognition is performed at super threshold, and because speech is a broadband signal, and because most hearing losses tend to be sloping configuration, we generally always need to mask. To determine masking level, first follow this easy formula. You take the presentation level of the test ear, then subtract the interaural attenuation of the transducer that you are using. Then add 20 dB as a buffer. What you'll notice here is that these two numbers are constants if you are always using the same transducer. So if your clinic always uses headphones, then the masking level equals the presentation level minus 20. If you use inserts, then the masking level equals the presentation level minus 35 decibels. Once you have derived your masking level, you have to take a look back at the audiogram and consider your assumption you made about the bone conduction threshold of the non-test ear. Okay, so for this example, we are presenting the sentences to the left ear at 65 decibels. So 65 minus 20 is 45. Now looking at his audiogram, he can't hear 45 dB in his right ear very well now, can he? No. So do we say that we don't have the mask? Hmm. So what did we assume about the bone conduction threshold of the right ear? 
Well, based on his abnormal emitting, we're assuming that there's a conductive component in that right ear. So we do have to mask. We have to make sure that sound is not being crossed over to that right cochlea. So let's present the broadband masking level to the right ear at 15 dB above the SRT at 65 decibels. Okay, so now we move on to bone conduction testing. What is the interoral attenuation of bone conduction? Zero dB. That's right, technically. The interoral attenuation of bone conduction can vary based on head sizes and skull thickness. So it's not truly zero dB, but it's close enough that we can assume that it's zero. But before we go into masking for bone conduction, we have to consider one thing. So Mike here has normal hearing, so his air conduction threshold is equal to his bone conduction threshold. Now my phenomenal student out there had just found out that the bone conduction threshold at 250 hertz is 10 dB. So now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put a headphone over his left ear as if I'm going to mask. Now Rachel, find that threshold again. Okay, so what is it? So now it's negative five. Why is that? It's because of the occlusion effect that happens in the low frequencies. The occlusion effect occurs in people who have normal hearing or sensory neural hearing loss. Lost? Okay, let me put it this way. I need you to count to three. Count with me. One, two, three. Come on, let me hear you. One, two, three. Now, I want you to stick your fingers in your ears and count again. One, two, three. Did you hear that? Your voice instantly got louder when you plugged up your ears. Now, why is that? Well, that's because of the occlusion effect. Now, if you didn't hear your voice get louder the second time you counted, well, you just may have a conductive loss because your middle ear system is literally acting like plugs in your ears. So why am I telling you this and making you count to three with fingers in your ears? Well, because of the seclusion effect, you have to add additional masking noise in the low frequencies to negate its effect. The additional masking values are 20 dB at 250 hertz, 15 dB at 500 hertz, and 10 dB at 1000 hertz. So if you are masking for bone conduction at 250 hertz and you start with 30 dB of masking noise, you should add 20 dB and start with 50 dB of masking noise due to the occlusion effect. Otherwise, you are under masking. So memorize these correction factors for correct bone conduction masking. Okay, so back to our example. So first, let's get the unmasked bone conduction threshold. She has placed the oscillator behind the patient's left ear and is ready to go. Again, we are gonna allow you, the viewer, to see the actual cochlear responses down there. We have a response. Now, which ear do you think that is? It's okay to not know, because sometimes it's actually both cochleas responding. So, which ear do you think it's likely to be? The left ear. Good, why? And don't say it's because the oscillator is behind the left ear. Because it's within 10 dB of the air conduction threshold of the left ear? Fair enough. Now the truth is we don't actually know which ear responded unless we ask the patient which ear they heard it in. The purpose of bone conduction testing is to determine the site of lesion whether the lesion is in the middle ear system, the inner ear system, or both. Because either the better of both cochleas are responding within 10 dB of the left ear conduction response, we can safely assume that the left ear is a sensory neural threshold and take the response of the left ear to document this decision. I think a more accurate way of documenting this response is to use the unspecified symbol, but this symbol isn't widely used. So maybe I should start a revolution. Okay, so Rachel has finished all the bone conduction testing and has found that the left ear has a sensory neural loss. Good job. Now we're gonna move on to the testing of the right bone conduction with masking. Okay, so where do you want the noise? Left ear. And where did the bone oscillator go? Behind the right ear. Very good. Now masking for bone conduction is just like masking for air conduction, except that you have to take the occlusion effect into account. So for this example, given the case history, the right admittance results, and the good word recognition score, we're going to assume that this loss in the right ear is a mixed loss. So, so we don't have to correct for the occlusion effect because they're already occluded. Very good. Now go get those plateaus.
Nicely done. Just look at that beautiful audiogram. You did that like a champ. I did it. Overmasking tends to happen in conductive or mixed losses, and it is what causes the masking dilemma. Masking dilemma occurs when there is a large conductive component in both ears so that you simply cannot mask effectively at all. So let's suppose I start air conduction threshold testing and I get the values ranging between 70 and 105 across the frequencies. Then I move on to bone conduction testing, unmasked responses of 15 to 20 dB across. Well, 70 minus 15 is 55 decibels, and that is greater than my interaural attenuation, so I have to mask. So I put in about 80 dB of noise in the right ear and present the tone. No response. Increase the level of the tone presented to the bone by 5 dB and respond. Increase the noise, no response. Increase the tone, respond. Noise, no response. What is happening? The sound of the masking noise is crossing back over to the test ear as you increase the noise, creating a masking dilemma. So you simply take the unmasked response, label it with an asterisk, and state that you cannot mask without overmasking. You have to confirm this at all frequencies. And you have a masking dilemma all around, even with the air conduction threshold. Now you just completed a crash course or review in masking. The last thing you need to remember is to always validate your audiometric findings by making sure everything agrees, from case history to emittance to pure tone and speech audiometry, because you are about to place that audiogram into the patient's medical record. All right, let's go do another one. Okay.